Hello. I'm sorry, we're a little late getting over here. No worries, no worries. All right, we'll give everybody a second to get switched over. I'm gonna go find my cat while we're, we're waiting on everybody. It's hiding somewhere. We got a new kid. Matt, that's a, mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. That's a pretty fancy boardroom you have there. Uh, okay. This is Summit 2.0. <laughs> uh <-huh. laughs> I'm digging it. Thank you. Hopefully one day, I'll, $5 million, that's all I need. Mm-hmm. Well, <laughs> it can happen. I think now's a tricky time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's in the cards. Different. It's a matter of when. Yep. Um, that's funny. Do you guys have a good meeting before? Mm hmm And as all good Southern meetings go, it goes long. <laughs> Indeed. Indeed. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> or South American meetings. Really? Yeah. Oh yeah. Time yeah. time is way different in, in that <laughs> culture. It um, is. It, it's it, there is a suggestion. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wish I could let go of some of my time issues. I definitely have a lot of uh, feeling and anxiety about things being very crisp and starting and ending, and I wish I could just let it go. <laughs> <laughs> Relocate to Colombia for about a year, and it'll it'll that'll do the trick. Yeah, I need to learn more Spanish too. So <laughs> win win. Yeah. <laughs> hey, Jillian, I have to. Um... Just a heads up, I have to jump off at about five fifty or um, about four fifty. Okay. Um, so I've got, I've got another meeting I have to be at at five. So I apologize. No, you're good. We will um, we'll start with you with our little fundraising chat first, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, however, I can help. Okay. I was going to pull up our agenda here real quick, and we'll go ahead with fundraising. I think everybody's on. Everybody made it over okay. Yes, I think we're good. Okay. All right. So this is kind of a little bit ghetto, but it's all right. Maybe. Okay. Here's our steering committee agenda. Um, so I ask everybody to think about some fundraising ideas that they may have. Um, and we have Matt here with us to kind of think through things, give us ideas. He is the ninja of all of these things. So, um, kind of throw out what your ideas are, what you're thinking. Um, Matt, do you want to start with anything? You want us just to throw things at you? You tell me what, what feels good to you. I'm good at ducking. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> um, no, I will give you a heads up. Um, I know that the last time um, you and I and Angela got together, we were talking about a gap of funding that existed that you felt like you needed to raise to be comfortable enough to make this transition. Yes. Out from under the umbrella to do be your own. And, and it was around $10,000. Was that right? Uh, 15, uh, tw 12 to 15 would be optimal. 10 would get us okay. there. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Um, I might have a lead on that for you. Um, I had a conversation today with a donor that, um, he's a, he's the head of an association and they are looking to, um, put some resources into the community to help at this time. And so I'm surfacing some options for him. And this was one that I'm strongly encouraging his team to consider and talk about and see if it would be a fit for what they want to do. Um, they, they're familiar with the organization. They're familiar with similar efforts in other counties. Um, they weren't aware of the, um, I guess, current dynamic of your relationship with um, Insight. And so they understood he was, he was, um, very receptive of the need to do your own thing uh, for without going into everything. Um, so I'll let you know how that plays out. It'll probably be the end of the week before I know something. 
um, but that could potentially be a very significant uh, boost in helping you get the resources that you need. So I'll keep you. in the loop. Thanks for keeping Thank us in mind. Thanks for that. Let us know if we can do anything yeah. to be helpful. I sure will. Yeah, at, at a minimum, I'm sure at some point there'll be an introduction and a conversation um, to go maybe a little deeper and answer any additional questions that they might have around programs or, um, you know, specific areas that you're involved in. I sort of painted it with a broader brush of some of the things that you were involved in because I didn't want to misspeak because I'm, I'm not 100% plugged into everything you're doing. But I, I let them know the things I was aware of and the impact that you guys are having. He was familiar with the um, New York Times article and some of the, the press from that. Um, but yeah, I'll let you know for sure how, um, how else we can move them towards that decision. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Awesome. So a question I have, um, is about fundraising in the time of COVID. That's like our new catchphrase for everything, right? Like the time <laughs> of COVID. Um, so can you talk a little bit about that? I've heard people say you shouldn't fundraise right now. I've heard People say this is a perfect time for fundraising. Kind of, will you just talk about that a little bit and your yeah. feelings on that and whatever? Absolutely. Um, so I've heard both as well. Um, and you'll, 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 you know, depending on your perspective, depending on your, your camp that you're in, you can make the case for either one. Um, I, I fall somewhere in the middle because I've spoken with donors who have said during this time that they are um, they are concerned about um, I guess donor fatigue is part of the the language that's being used um, because especially in a smaller community like ours, a lot of the same people get asked over and over and over again. Um, they're on everybody's mailing list. They're just seen as you know very generous, very philanthropic people. Um, but out of that, out of all of those requests has become, they've become sensitive to, um, I guess the abundance of organizations in our community that are nonprofits that ask for money, that ask for resources, that ask for help. And so there, they are, there's a, I don't want to there again, paint this too broadly, but there's somewhat of, a, of an attitude that in this, not to be insensitive, but it wouldn't be a bad thing if some of the nonprofits didn't make it through this time. Um, they feel like there's just a lot of maybe duplication of services to use that phrase, which I'm not a fan of, but it, you'll hear it. Um, and so I think donors are being a little more strategic in where they're choosing to invest, which I think is great. I think that's a, not a bad thing. I think you should always invest where you're passionate um, and you should find things that align with your values and your, your, um, your heart and go deep. So my conversations with them have been about doing just that, about getting a little more laser focused and not spreading things super broad and not really making an impact anywhere. Um, you know, we've had a couple of organizations and donors who have come to us and they're leveraging us to find places to put resources and in, you know, they're, they're not opposed and they're not, um, they don't think that, you know, a United way COVID-19 fund is a bad thing, but they want to have a little bit more direction around where those funds are going and, and where they're used. Um, just because they're aware now of needs that they weren't aware of before, um, the abundance of need out there. And so my, sort of advice to them has really been to spend some time and figure out, let us help you figure out the area of need that you really need to be investing in. So is it at risk youth? Is it the food insecure? Is it the homeless population? Is it, you know, veterans? Is it those impacted by drug and, and substance abuse? What is it, right, that, that inspires you, that motivates you, that you're passionate about? And then once we can narrow that down, let's identify some agencies that we know that are doing great work um, and that can put those funds to use immediately. Um, and so part of that is storytelling. We've talked about this before, is we're all storytellers. The, our, your employees, your donors, your volunteers, everybody is a storyteller for your organization. So in this time of mass communication of need, 
are we creating a narrative that one is compelling, but two is cohesive. So, you know, if I'm talking to a donor, if I'm with your organization, I'm talking with a donor about uh, Carter County drug prevention, and then they go and they meet with Angela, it, are they hearing the same themes? Are they hearing the same need? Are they hearing the same impact? Or are we really disjointed and, and going in a lot of different directions and creating somewhat of confusion around our mission and our impact and what we're doing, and what we are seek to be doing in this community? So creating a clear, compelling, cohesive message right now that everybody affiliated with your organization is reading off the same script from is a big, is a key. Um, so I know you guys have worked towards that, um, but I would just encourage you in that, don't, don't take that lightly at this point, um, right? So, and it doesn't have to be, you know, this big, huge narrative, it can be very concise. Um, it can be, they're gonna, it's kind of like, the analogy we use is a bakery with, you know, two week old bread, not a good place to go and get bread. You know, if we're a, a nonprofit and we're and we need to have stories that are fresh and that are compelling. So if we're still telling stories from 2015, we might need to go find some new stories, right? So what are some things that are that are current, uh, at least within the last you know six, 12 months that we've been doing to further our mission and our impact in our communities, um, and finding people that that message resonates with, right? We know that that message isn't going to resonate with everybody. Not everybody's passionate about drug prevention. Not everybody understands the need. Not everybody understands how that trickles down into, you know, all the economic elements of our community. And, and that's okay, right? We're not out there trying to convince somebody uh, that we need to be their number one nonprofit or their number one area of need that they need to be concerned about. We want to try to find those people that have a natural inclination or a bent or have shown some type of engagement in this area before. Um, but part of that is there is there again, what's that messaging? What's that narrative? Um, we've talked before, I think with this group about the concept of starting with why and defining your why and not getting caught up in the how and the what, um, because those things change, you know, just, just, I mean, we're experiencing it right now. Um, how everything in our world has had to change really overnight and with your, even with your organization, you think about the how you were doing something before, you're not doing that that way anymore, right? You can't, you know, you're having to change things. And if, you, if people buy into the how you do it, then we potentially lost them as a donor, as a volunteer, as a whatever they were, their capacity was, um, if they weren't bought into why we're doing what we're doing. And, and are we spending our time there? Are we creating clarity around why we're doing this, why it's important, and why should they care about it, right? So creating that message, creating clarity around that message in a very just concise way um, so that you can get in front of a donor because there again, you are competing at a very high level right now for their attention, way more than you were before. Um, because now they're not only getting hit up from local organizations, they're getting hit up from national organizations because the rate at, at which lists are being sold and traded and everything right now is exponential. I mean, people are buying lists like crazy just to try to get their message in front of your donors um, to say, hey, we're all competing for funds. And, you know, they're getting mailers from people from Atlanta and Charlotte and Nashville and all over the place um, because they've given to maybe they gave to you. And now they've shown up on your 990 and they think, oh, they gave to them. So now they bought a list, you know, that they're getting hit, hit from all over um, for their resources and their funds. So that leads me into the, the element of. Um, strategy, I would say, is relational, not transactional. Right now, we, we need to be hyper intensive, hyper focused on our relationships and building those relationships and maintaining those relationships and not just getting stuck in a transaction. All right. And that's why when we talk about fundraising, you'll, you'll very rarely hear us be advocates for things like 5Ks or raffles or silent auctions or things of that nature because it just puts people in a transactional mindset, right? It puts them in just this mindset that, okay, I gave you, you know, $50 for your golf tournament. So now I've supported your organization. Well, that was great. But $30 of that went right back into the operating expense of doing the golf tournament. So really you gave us $20. 
Um, so how can we create avenues? How can we create entry points for people relationally and not just in a transaction mindset? Um, and that's what this time gives you the opportunity to do, right? It's, you guys have a heartstring message. That's a, that's a win. That's a pro in your pros and cons category. Um, and how do you pull on those heartstrings? You, what are those stories? You know, the stories of impact, the stories of lives that are changed, the stories of generational, you know, poverty that have been broken because of getting away from, you know, the substance abuse issues that people and their, you know, great grandpa, grandpa, dad all struggled with, but now that's been broken. Um, right. Does that make sense? Very much. Yeah. So getting, getting, going deeper rather than broader is what I would tell you right now. This is, I, you know, I'm seeing organizations starting new programs and doing all these different new things. And I think that's a mistake or it can be a mistake as long, if it wasn't a well thought out strategy before COVID-19, you know, if it was already in the works and this is just something now you've chosen to execute, that's one thing, but just to start something new, but just because you think you can get funding for it right now, I don't think that's a good strategy. Um, I would say that's probably a, a, not a good idea. Um, Thank you. That's helpful. Yeah. And then the trick is, you know, finding those people to, to build the relationship with carefully, not selecting them just because they have deep pockets, mm -hmm. um, understanding why they might have a passion for this particular subject area for youth and children. And when we talk about the why I think that is something that we can continue to craft during our retreat time together. But, you know, I don't think that if we're all asked as a steering committee right now, if we were quizzed, I think we would have highly variant versions of what CCDP does. So I think reminding us to really talk about the why, um, and then, yeah, I think we'll continue to probably look to you and others to help us figure out how to create those relationships. I know uh, we have a few people in mind that are passionate about this topic, but um, might need some advice on how to approach what that looks like, you know, without feeling like the ask is first and how to invite them to things, especially when, you know, physically we may not be able to invite them. So, yeah. Sure. And, and the best, the best story lies somewhere in the mix, right? As you said, everybody's going to have their own uh, narrative, but yeah, the best one is probably the, the amalgamation of all of those together where you refine it and, and wordsmith it and you can get to something that's very compelling, but also very intense. Um, mm -hmm. So what I would tell you as well, just around that thought, Angela, is um, leveraging existing relationships. So asking people, who do they know that you need to know? Uh, that's always one of my favorite questions to ask anytime I sit down with a, a donor um, or a supporter of our, of our organization, especially if we're, we're doing something new or we have something on the horizon that we need to, to um, raise additional support for, is who do they know that we need to know? Um, because in the conversation, so many times it's happened is as you're talking about, you know, your mission and your impact and this new program or whatever, they're thinking about people already. Uh, especially your connectors, <clears throat> they're thinking about them already. But if we're not intentional about asking that, it'll get lost. You know, rarely will they volunteer that on their own. It's not because they don't want to, it's just because it, you know, another thought comes in their mind or we've gone on to another subject or something else. But always circling back before you, you leave with them and ask them, who do you know that we need to know? Who do you know that's passionate about what we're passionate about? Because they may not be. All right. Just because it's a, it's a new program or it's something else they've been engaged in the past, but they're not currently. So they might be on to something else. That doesn't mean they don't know somebody that they feel like, Oh yeah, you know, Susie needs to know about what you guys are doing because Susie is on fire for that. Um, and so, and then ask, okay, is there a warm introduction that you could potentially help us make? Um, you know, is it us going to grabbing, you know, Starbucks together? Is it going to grab Panera together? Is it um, you know, a zoom call? Um, where it's that warm introduction, where it's somebody they trust that's giving them the introduction to you, um, and then just sort of letting you run with, uh, with your spiel. That makes good sense. Thank you. What other questions do y'all have for Matt before we lose him? Some good thought processes happening in the chat box over here. I'm just saying. 
How oh, good. Is there anything in there that we need to, I haven't pulled it up, sorry. Mm -mm. No, I, I, I just think it's good stuff. So. What else for Matt? Matt, what's the one thing we could really be using this pandemic germination time, for lack of a better way to put it? Uh, what, what one to three thoughts would you encourage us to be rolling around in the back of our minds? I would challenge you to be thinking about what do you want um, CCDP to look like on the other side of this? Um, okay. and, and on the other side of it, I don't mean just on the other side of the pandemic. I mean, once you guys are an independent 501c3. Right. So once all the restraints are off, once all bets are off, all the handcuffs, all the whatever, once you are fully in control of this wonderful organization, what do you want that to look like? Um, you know, through impact, through funding, through, you know, I would even go to go as far as to say um, uh, Jim Collins uses the acronym BHAG, big, hairy, audacious goal. Right. So dream big. You know, if a donor puts you in their estate, you may not even know it. Next week, you get a call from an attorney that says, hey, guess what? Mrs. Smith has passed away and you've got one hundred thousand dollars sitting in an account with your name on it. Mm -hmm. You've got one million dollars sitting in an account with your name on it. What would the organization look like? What would you do with those types of opportunities? Um, because I'll tell you, once the reins are off, once you guys are your own organization, those things are not out of the realm of possibility. Um, but we've all heard the stories and seen the, the TLC shows about people who've won the lottery and it's destroyed their lives and destroyed their families and everything else. Well, the same holds true for organizations. We've seen organizations that have gotten windfalls that they weren't prepared for. And it absolutely tore the organization apart from the inside out. The board began infighting. There was different strategies or different approaches, and it just, it was a nightmare. Um, the same way it was for the family that won the lottery. So for you guys, I'd be thinking about real strategic, tactical things that we want to do maybe different, maybe better, uh, maybe new on the other side of this, meaning both outside of COVID-19 and once we're our own independent organization. Thank you. Um, my pleasure. What else y'all got from it? I think that gives us a really good place to start and to work from. Um, and then knowing that you're there, that we can continue to, to touch base with you again. And I know that you've also been helping us with some of the intricacies of unraveling our current 501c3 relationship and name and registration with our new process and so um, thank you so much for helping with that because some of that is just way deeper than I can understand well thank you for thank you for being involved in it and Jillian I got your email on Monday and I'll give you a call I was, I was, we could do that virtually or we can do it over the phone and help you decipher kind of what you got back so some of that's valid. Some of it is not really that relevant um, for where you are in the time frame that you're going to have to work with. So um, I can help you sort through that. Thank I'll you. give you a call tomorrow. And then if I miss you, we, we, we're good at playing phone tag. So yeah. if I miss you, just call me back and we'll connect. So Thank yeah, happy, happy to help with that. And then, yeah, we're here for you guys. Don't, don't forget that. Call, email, text, leverage us any way that you can. Um, and then I'll be in touch again. Hopefully by the end of the week is, was his commitment to me. Um, about maybe some funding. So, yay. Yeah, amazing. That's awesome. Let's yep. keep in the loop. All right. And when it comes down to it, if we can help you get that fancy uh, building behind you, we'll, we'll do what we can to re repay the favor, the work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We'll, we're going to sit in that room one day as a team. We really will. I see it. Great. All around the table. All right. Let's do it. Thank you, Matt. <laughs> awesome, guys. Thank you all so much. Have a great meeting, and um, we'll talk to you soon. All right. Thanks, Bye. Bye, guys. Okay. So, any thoughts about that before moving forward? I just love him. Can I just say how much I love him? He is so helpful. Mm -hmm. I think he makes a good point about donor fatigue. Mm -hmm. It's just how do you figure out where where are our people in the region in the donor fatigue cycle? 
our stakeholders. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know how you ascertain that. Do you, Jillian? I don't. Or anyone? I don't. And I, I'm just looking at who's on here. Um, I, I was thinking about this with Crystal on the other call a little bit because I think sometimes um, even that is kind of interesting. Um, the way that that United Way kind of knows us and knows Sam and so she's just like here's you some money um, right. and so you know I love that in a way um, but I also I don't know I just have all kinds of thoughts about that I guess um, and so I, I was thinking about that too and about if there are you know other organizations that see that with United Way or see like Carter County is so small in their funding kind of pools. And, and I feel like we have this like, Oh, United way gives them money or, Oh, overcoming that I think is a barrier too. So I say all that to say, I think we have some donors who are more likely to be like, Oh, let's focus on this because we know red legacy has whatever Carter County drug prevention has whatever. Um, and so I don't know. I think that's something with donors that I have seen um, because we are thriving in a way we're almost overlooked if that kind of makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, and so I don't, I'm not seeing fatigue as much as I'm seeing um, kind of like y'all got this and you are doing so many things and you're awesome and we don't need to help you. Um, if that kind of, I don't know if that answered your question at all, but that's kind of what yeah. I feel is um, people think we're good. We're good to go. And it, it came to me a lot when um, our building is for sale and people were like, Oh, are you guys having trouble? Because we thought you had all kinds of money and you guys were like doing amazing things and whatever. So I hadn't really thought about it like that before um, until that happened. Like we're not selling our building. Our landlord is selling our building and funny that you think we own this building, but okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, and lots of people came with that. Like, so I think overcoming that, I mean, we don't want to say like, we don't want to overcome all of that. I mean, we want them to think we're thriving and, and awesome, but also how do we mindfully say, but also you still need to support us too, so we can keep doing awesome things. So I don't know. That was kind of word vomit, but that's where I am a little bit with it. I got you. It makes sense. And I think figuring out, I, I see what you're saying about the United Way and, and being Carter County small, Elizabeth and small, a lot of long-time people who've been there all know one another, but what happens if the personalities or who's in charge of a certain entity that gives money changes? If it's a personality based almost, I know I've known you 30 years transaction, is that kind of what you're saying a little bit? And so if we had like a, a sustainability plan that factored that in, but another couple of things, you know, um, and I don't know what that looks like yet. I know that marketing wise, Facebook and Instagram is a really ex inexpensive way to keep an ad almost going on a daily basis and people can donate if they're so inclined. But I don't know that that's a route that we necessarily want to go, but, but it is a combo that works for keeping things in people's stream. I know that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that social media is a great way to use our storytelling and I think to to get focused on what is our story and how do we tell it and is there a thread between all of these things that we post and like the why. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we can use that, but I do think moving away from that transactional thought process of fundraising and if what we're doing is building relationships with people, then we'll know through our relationship if they're fatigued if they're being over asked because what we're starting is just by building a relationship. So I love going that route because I do think it circumvents so many of these things that we're worried about, you know, mm -hmm. grant writing and, and doing fundraisers that, you know, maybe send the wrong impression. Um, so if we're just building relationships with folks that are passionate about this and they're referring us to other people that are passionate about this, um, it seems to make a lot of sense. And I've been told this in the past and I don't know why, you know, I needed Matt to remind me of this 
this way of doing things. But I mean, I can already think of two or three people that I would say, I know you're passionate about it. And I know you have a lot of friends that have experienced, you know, challenge with challenges with substance misuse. Who would you think that I need to talk to? You know, who do you know that I don't know? Um, and really, honestly, if this one donor comes through, we're good to go on moving forward <laughs> with our, you know, that will give us what we need um, to move forward in a safe financial way. But if we're thinking BHAG, what is our big, hairy, audacious goal, then these relationships, I think, are really important. Hey, it's Anise. Um, I got a couple of like ideas. Um, we all know that Red Legacy is a nonprofit, and um, yes, we are draining through the state of Tennessee. Fundraising has always been an issue for me since the time that I came in in June of 2018. Um, it's horrible. I'm not going to lie, it's horrible. Um, but what we came into, um, I have one solid donor that gives me a certain amount a month. And the reason why I have this certain amount a month is because we transported her daughter from Laurel Bloom blooms i'm sorry to um boone street daily we wanted to buy another vehicle i put that out on facebook we don't get a lot of donations in we don't but she messaged me right before christmas and said hey i want to talk to you about this i want to start donating this amount of money so you can buy a new vehicle i saved up enough money on my own just from random donations that do come in from august until no February. well yeah almost february and then with her donations enough to put a huge down payment on a used vehicle okay there's how i feel about it with crystal on that aspect i've received i do receive um i'm a recipient of the efsb money from crystal that was set before i got there um we do have a grant. We just got grant money, a thousand dollars for Gypsy Souls and Company, um, which was our business that we had back in January. Um, and this last two amounts of money that I got from Washington County and um, Crystal as well. I don't. I, I had to write a big grant for it. I don't. <laughs> I mean, I just sat and write down like an actual huge proposal for that. Um, I can work in all eight. United Ways if I want to. Um, I serve eight counties, but it's very hard. Um, but I do understand that aspect. Those of us that do know Crystal with United Way, she's very personal about things sometimes. Um, I do appreciate her helping me um, because we did need some money for care packages. I'm sending out care packages to my clients once a week. Um, but I will say that it's gonna take, and what it does take, somebody on the inside that works hand in hand with us every day to know somebody else on the outside and that's where my do that's where my money that sits in my savings account comes from so because they go out and tell the community hey this is what sam's doing right now these are what these girls are doing right now you know like i had this same lady say hey well if i put you in front of our church they'll get you a new car i said no i'm not doing that but that's what it took, like, that's what it's taking. Um, like, we received a check from a church, like, two, like, a month ago, I think, or, I'm sorry, about three months ago, um, out of the ordinary. And it's just because that person works hand in hand with me every week. And they see the progress that we're making every day. But my, myself, I did, fundraisers are blocked. Um, I think that we put so much work into it that at the end of the day, we just, don't come out like kind of like Matt said. Um, you know, I know Julian and I did one for our um, our travel baseball team, and we just we almost put in more money than what we made. It felt like, but I think that if we work hard enough, and if we talk to people that know people that know people, unfortunately, that we may be able. No, not we may be able. I, I know we can find donors within our community that will help fulfill what we need because we've got to move forward with this. Okay, so moving forward, um, we can talk a little bit more about this. Um, at the leadership retreat, hopefully we'll, we'll have 
um, a little bit more time there to kind of hash through who we are and what that looks like and whatever. Um, but I think being mindful of who you're in contact with that maybe you could reach out to at this point um, would be helpful and just kind of, Hey Fran, come on. You're good. Come on in. Uh, good. How are you? Um, so just, sorry, hold on two seconds. You, oh, you're good, buddy. Thank you. Okay. You are awesome. Yeah, okay. Because there's a bunch of stuff for you guys. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure it's perfect. It's good. And Shannon will call you if you need something else. Okay. Sure. You are awesome. And then text me when I can do training or whatever. Yep. I'm going to put out the word to my small group. So our church is still not letting us meet. But if we Zoom call it. Then... Yeah, we can do a Zoom call. Sure. I'll do it. So. You're awesome. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Sorry, friends. Um, person bringing a mentor application back. Good times. Um, so does everybody feel okay with that, with right now, everyone sending vibes and prayers and happy thoughts and all the things to Summit and whoever his rich friend is um, and being mindful of who we know, um, kind of starting to think through what, asking would look like. Um, I can talk to some a little bit more about the ask, get us some good, um, just kind of, I don't know that there's evidence-based ways to ask people for money, um, but kind of, um, kind of looking at, at um, best practices there and whatever. So I'll kind of try to get some of that together. Um, if you all will just be thinking about who you may know um, and start kind of building those relationships. Um, I think Angela did a really good job of starting this storytelling process. Um, if you are at the Day of Hope, that's something that, that she kind of put together for us to share where we came from and all the things that have happened in the meantime and all that. Um, and so I think that's a really good place for us to look at, at starting to build that story um, and kind of, kind of go from there. Does that feel okay to everybody for y'all to kind of be thinking through some people? We'll, send good vibes to Matt and his rich friends and I'll work on some evidence-based making that a donation something for you all. Feel that like exists. I do think that that's a real thing like how you how and when you ask. Um, there's some definite information out there about that and really what we're doing first is building a relationship. The ask is an art that maybe we'll have someone designated to do and we'll get some training on that. But yeah, I think firming up our story, why we do what we do and being on the same page with that while we're building relationships are the best first steps. Okay. Yeah. That feel good to everybody. Feels good. It feels great. Let's do it. So I feel like I'm doing this meeting completely backwards, but I wanted to use Matt's time while we had him. Um, so I'm going to pretend like it's the beginning of the meeting and say, welcome new steering committee members. Um, I went ahead and I'm just assuming since there's five of you and five positions available that you're going to win this election. So congratulations. <laughs> on that. Um, and I'm super, super excited to have our new people on board. Um, I can't say enough about the work all of you do. Um, and I just think that you guys will bring even more awesomeness to our team. So thank you. Thank you for being here and committing to, to hang out with this crazy crew and their cats and children and Jill brought pom pom. So we're winning already. Like we got this. Um, so thanks for being here. Um, I did want to talk a little bit about, um, Oh, this cat has decided to try to eat me now all of a sudden um about positions a little bit um so i'm gonna just beg angela y'all can watch me beg to stay treasurer uh, <laughs> no shame in in me begging right now for that um so oh, my vote good my vote okay that's good pretend like exactly. I had a choice and i wasn't like please begging you um, I've come too far to turn around now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, so chair right now is Ashley. Vice chair is Sam. Secretary is Nicole. I know that Nicole would like to bow out of secretary. Um, so that position's up for grabs. If anybody's feeling super clerical, 
why I'm like typing minutes as we meet because Nicole. That's actually a genius idea though, to type them while we meet. I feel yeah. like everyone was judging Who my knew? spelling errors and all, like <laughs> we're all looking at my lack of grammar. <laughs> so anybody feeling like they want to be secretary? I feel like you're gonna have to ask somebody like I you know, think so too. I heard okay. that um, <laughs> Jill just did. I'm pretty sure Jill is hiding from me currently. Oh, Jill just ran, uh, dude. Yeah, she went she's away. Told. She's out. She said, no. I saw your nominator. Go ahead and throw uh, her out there. <laughs> so I heard that Red Legacy has this really good secretary, and I was thinking she might be a good fit. I don't know, Kim Crowder, but if I was <laughs> just throwing that out there. Does anybody else want to be secretary? <laughs> So are chair and vice chair cool with staying chair and vice chair? What are y'all feeling? I am, this is Sam, I'm good with it. As long as you all, everybody is in agreement that I'm doing okay at my job, trying to move forward, uh, do all the things, do all Jillian's adventures. But if you want to move me out, you can. I don't want to, really, I don't. But I'm just saying, if there's a better fit, we can move me out. Everybody cool with Sam staying? I think nobody's dying to be vice chair of the board. Okay. Well, dying. Right. Um, does Jill Stott want to be the secretary now that she's back in the frame? Oh, Jill oh, Stott, we nominated you. <laughs> she's going, no. Okay. Okay. okay no, no, I okay. made a motion for Kim and seconded it yeah. and voted. Mm, okay. Oh. <laughs> Jill knows how to get it done. I am not, I will do a lot of things. The secretary is not one. Oh, no. I don't have the attention span for it. Down my road and y'all that threw me under it. Thank you. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Welcome to you. You can't do that to Kim. <laughs> All right, Ashley, stay in chair. My I'll do whatever you want me to. <laughs> my favorite part of the last meeting was when your closet appeared in the library. Like yes. Perfect thing. That was my favorite part. <laughs> All right, Ashley, stay chair. Topping it. Whatever you want, whatever you need me to do, I'll do, you know that. I know. That's what all y'all say. I will, I don't, am I on mute? Nope. Um, I will say that I think that it is, I know we have fun with this, and right now we are a steering committee, and it's a little loosey-goosey, we don't have to have a quorum, we don't have to have Robert's Rules of Order. Do understand that what we're signing up here for is to be an official legal board within the next six months or less. So, like, we have to have a quorum, we have to have, we don't have to do Robert's Rules of Order, but, like, we have it's not going to be loosey goosey anymore and it's going to be a little more like we, we are going to have directors and operators insurance to protect us but i guess i just want to put that out there that I mean we're going to have to be a little more formal and we're going to have to do a little more work i think it's going to take a little more commitment and time and so i guess i just want to say that out loud i think that's well said and timely and and it's good to be shifting up uh, you know uh, that's a good shift you know I just want to respect the fact that people are volunteering and making sure that they have the time we all have the time that we can do it so that we're both not hurting ourselves and overextending ourselves but able to be there for each other and that you know we can put in the time that it'll it, that it's going to take and I don't think it's going to be so overwhelming but it's going to be it's going to be a thing a little bit a little bit more All right. Thank you. Everybody cool? Mm -hmm. I think we're good. Run away, run away screaming. <laughs> okay. All right. So can you, so we do this super fun thing. I always make Angela explain it because she does it better than I do. Um, but instead of Robert's rules, because that's very boring and that is not who we are here. Um, we do this super fun thing to vote. And so Angela, will you explain the voting process? 
Yeah, it's something that we just did in the past called Fist to Five. It's a weird name. I kind of hate the name, but essentially, you know, if you're totally for something, you do this, um, or you can do a scale when you're typing five. Four, you know, pretty much for it, have a little bit of reservation. Three, which is, okay, I support it. A little reservation. Two, not feeling great about it, but I won't like die one, not really in favor, but if everyone else is, I can do it. And this is like, I absolutely cannot support this thing that I'm voting on. Um, and so it just gives a good representation when people do have reservations about things. It's not necessarily more voting for people, but they have reservations about budget decisions or leases or projects. You know, I think it gives a pulse that is different than a yes or no. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So if you all will in the chat box, if you don't want it to be shared publicly, totally cool with that. You can send it to me privately. Um, but if you will send a zero through five on all four of these officers. So it should say Ashley five, Sam five, Angela five, Kim five, or whatever your rankings are for these people in the chat, chat box. That sounded terrible. Ranking people. You know what I mean? <laughs> I don't know if I have everyone. Okay, Angela, Kim, Ashley, Jill. Nope. You just Damn. need to vote Ashley, Sam, Angela, Kim. Officers only. That's what we're voting for. And technically these positions don't start until July 1st, um, but we don't really have a meeting. I mean, we, this is our steering committee meeting between now and our July retreat. So I figure we can go ahead and, and roll it out and make it happen. So, unless we get the wonderful donor and all the things change between now and then, think positive. <laughs> Called meeting. We can have a call. Yes. Yeah. Very true. Be a good reason to have a call meeting. Oh, would. Be such a good reason. Yes. Okay. Um, so, one other thing that I wanted to bring to your attention um, in our DFC grants, I think Dolly had to hop off. Um, her mom's dog was having an emergency. So send happy thoughts to Dolly's mom's dog. Um, so in our DFC action plan originally, we had um, put about $125,000 over five years into creating an online training center, online and in-person training center. Um, so this would be a learning management system. P people could buy into it. It could potentially be a moneymaker for us. It could be both for organizations to receive training as well. <laughs> people to receive training. Um, I still feel like that's something that is a need in our community in some ways, um, somewhere that people can access things all in the same place. Jill can't train building strong brains in Washington, Carter and Unicoi County on the same day, but a Jill stop training of some sort in a virtual platform could do those things. Um, so I see real benefit in creating a system sort of like this. Um, so Dolly is doing the needs assessment right now to gauge where organizations are with that, if it's something they would use. Um, just a, a couple of concerns that I've had is a lot of agencies feel like they have kind of gone this way on their own <laughs> um, because they haven't had a choice. So they are um, working to record their own trainings and um, their own presentations and kind of getting things virtually anyway. Um, I don't know that for a fact. That's why Dolly's going to go out and research it and see. Um, but I still, I feel like a training center would be very valuable in some capacity. I still feel very confident that in five years we can create some sort of training center of some, on some level, even if it's not the $125,000 version we originally envisioned. What that money looks like, it sounds like more money when I say it that way, um, but it was about $25,000 to get it up and running, and then it was about $25,000 a year to keep it going. Um, so that's what, what the breakdown was for, for that training center. Um, I've proposed something to treasurer extraordinaire um and she kind of recommended that we have a, a discussion about it because it's a lot of money um and so i wanted us just to talk about this a little bit um 
I would love to use really the first year's training center budget um, to train some folks in Triple P. Um, if you don't know a lot about Triple P, I think Ashley attached a little infographic or something. I don't know what you put on there. Yeah. Something Triple P, just an overview um, on the email that she sent inviting you all to this meeting. Um, I have kind of a roadmap in sort of sorts developed um, with Triple P. I'm going to attempt to show it to you. Oh, wait, I sent it to you. Actually, never mind. So I attached my roadmap in that email um, to you all as well. And what this looks like to me is um, engaging as many partners as we can across the community to implement positive parenting programs, um, provide consistent messaging to parents. Um, Triple P offers five levels. This is insanely fast, but the first level is really um, marketing. It's consistent messaging across the, the community as far as billboards and um, flyers, educational materials. We had an opportunity to, to talk to some Triple P folks last week. I didn't really realize that most of what my Starters Never Start campaign last year um, that we did was actually considered level one triple P um, because it's just using the people in your community, using what works in your community to promote positive parenting. Um, so we would up that, um, get some more flyers, get some more brochures, get better marketing messages. Um, but just using that level one as kind of that consistent messaging throughout the community. So level two, Ashley, Angela, myself, um, Jenny Wright, Brittany Shown, um, Jenny at Boys and Girls Club, Brittany at Elizabeth and Housing, um, Christy DeLoach at Hampton, and then some other people that fell off the wagon that I don't even remember who they were that we trained. Um, so we have all been trained in seminars. This is offering three kind of standalone classes, Power of Positive Parenting, um, Raising Resilient Children, Raising Confident, Competent Children. What Ashley and I have learned from offering those classes and from living in this place um, is that a one-off seminar kind of deal is not cutting it um, for a lot of these parents. There are parents that always get something great out of the seminar and go home and continue living their lives. And there are parents that we grieve leaving that room because we feel like um, we just didn't give them what they really needed. And so Triple P levels three, four, and five are kind of the answer to that. Um, so my proposed plan is level three discussion groups. So Dolly um, and then the breastfeeding peer counselor at our health department, Grasha, um, have created this virtual mom support group. They're meeting like three times a week right now. Um, really engaging Grasha's WIC mamas, Grasha's health department mamas, um, and kind of just creating that relationship that I think discussion groups will then fall into perfectly. Um, it's not limited to that scenario. They can offer these groups live in person at the health department here at the office. Um, if an organization says I have a group of five moms that I want you to come do discussion groups with, they can do it wherever. Um, but that will be discussion groups. We will do um, level four standard triple P. So this is really another discussion group kind of model. Um, but this one we will have standard, which is zero to 12 and also teen, um, which is kind of my heart. Sam will um, work on that one too. Sam has a, a background. We were trained last I don't know how long ago, a couple years ago, in sexuality education, and Sam um, picked up on the teen part of that and really has embraced that and done a fantastic job with it, um, and so I feel like Sam will be a good fit there. Um, also, somebody at the high school will be trained in teen, so when they have parents that, at Elizabeth in high school, sorry, um, so when they have parents that are struggling or need help or whatever, they'll be able to offer Triple P there. Um, the other component is a primary care model, um, which it's called primary care, doesn't necessarily have to be implemented in a primary care setting. Um, so we're gonna actually implement it in juvenile court in a couple um, primary care settings. So when we'll train Hannah in juvenile court, um, she's the person that mamas and daddies bring their kiddos to, to pay fines or court costs or get a schedule for community service or whatever. And so if that mom says to her, this kid is out of control, I don't know what to 
to do, she will be trained to do about a 15 minute intervention with that parent right at that moment, give them a tip sheet, um, and then also have all of the other discussion groups and other levels to refer to if that parent needs more than what she's able to provide. Um, and then Ashley and I this time um, are going to be trained to do the divorcing parent classes. Um, that's really about the only parenting class that's available in Carter County right now. And it super sucks. Um, it's just bad. They watch a video and it's really bad. Um, and so we would be able to engage folks that are divorcing with some actual evidence based um, curriculum kind of stuff instead of just here's this video have a good time figuring this out. Um, and then level five, we would also train um, Dr. Lori Hamilton in pathways. Um, and that's a, a triple P level specifically for at risk kids so, and their parents. So she would actually um, have the tools to work with. If Red Legacy had a woman that was struggling with parenting, um, she would actually be able to do one on one with them. Um, and so my, my goal with with that, with Ashley and I, with these kind of levels that are um, implemented a little bit differently would be just for us to be kind of the hub, um, the resource place. And so whoever in the community has a need, um, they would be able to reach out to us and we could say, that sounds like a good fit for level three, or that sounds like a good fit for discussion groups, whatever it may be. Um, I see Triple P as a huge part of the training center as well, because I think um, it's something that we can do again, it's a program that we will be offering training on. Um, and so I, I hope that we in time have buy-in from other organizations as well, places that we don't get to train sort of this first round or second round or whatever. Um, but the goal is really a community level shift in the way we, the way we're parenting, the way we talk about parenting, the way that we um, engage with our kids in general. Um, and so that's where I would like the money to go. Um, it's about $23,000 um, to train that many people in all of these levels. Um, the reason I'm pushing for this a little bit right now is um, these trainings are usually only offered in California and where else, Ashley? Columbia, South Carolina. Columbia, South Carolina. Um, so normally to get a level of Triple P, it would be about the $2,000 per person training fee plus travel to South Carolina for um, most of them are three days and then you go back a couple months later for a fourth day. Um, so it would be a lot of travel and it's why we have not been able to get this kind of amount of people trained in the past because it, we're looking at double probably um, the 23,000 to be able to do this but they're offering them all virtually right now and so we would be able to train quite a few people um, that we wouldn't be able to do otherwise. So that's kind of my thought in pushing for it right now, um, being able to get that, that done while we have an opportunity to get more bang for our buck. Um, and then if you look at the plan I sent, I've been really mindful um, in incorporating sort of a lot of different sectors in our community. So we have a church involved if folks feel like is Carter County and our parenting advice comes from our church, um, we have that for them. Or if they are a mama who's just in juvenile court having a breakdown because our kid's in juvenile court and she doesn't know what to do, we have that. Um, we have the library, we have all of these different places um, so that it is really a community level intervention and not just, um, not that Ashley and I don't love doing seminars but it's also not really making community level change it's something that we're we're helping some folks and it's great um, but i feel like with this model we'll really be able to um, have this sort of across the board i've got two pediatricians offices that are on board to train a staff member so we kind of hopefully be that same consistent messaging that they get at church at the pediatrician's office in the WIC clinic, um, divorcing parent class, the billboards they see, um, it would all kind of tie in together. So that's my big dream for this. Um, and it, it is a super big dream. Um, like new people, it's not very often that I ask for $23,000, I promise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> just saying like welcome welcome on board here um 
So I just wanted to, to kind of throw that out there, have some discussion about it. I know hopefully Angela, you have some, some thoughts to add. That was a very fast lot of information. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions or talk more about it, but that's kind of basic what I'm thinking. So there are four things I was rolling around in my head when you were talking, right? <laughs> One, um, sorry, I just came out of a macro practice social work class. So that's where my <laughs> head is. <laughs> okay. So there are four things I just put on a final exam this morning. One of them is strengths and capacity building. Yep. That's what you're talking about in a timely manner in a zoom type format. And then that'll just trickle out. Right. Cause capacity builds capacity. All right empowerment, resilience, and sustainability, right? Everything you talked about hit on all four of those things. I mean, so I'm the person on boards that generally asks this question, is there any reason not to spend the money now? That's, that would be my thing. Is there any reason not to? And somebody who's been around longer on this board should answer that, but it doesn't seem like it will be a bad thing to do that at all. I agree with Kim in the aspect. Um, we all know that STEM doesn't do well with small children. With, um, and I'm a single mom, you know, so parenting's different. Um, in the beginning when I met Julian, all I knew was about this triple P stuff. That's all I knew. Triple P, triple P. I'm like, what is this? I've got I've got my kids under control. Really, ultimately I didn't. Through the time frame that I've just been friends with Julian and Ashley both, they have helped me in my own home with the triple B. Um, Julian, just, I, Julian, I don't know what that other level I am, the train, the other triple P training I went through, what, a couple of months ago? Yeah. And it made, like, I was, like, very grateful to be asked to do that because I'm by no means a perfect parent. But I can ultimately tell you from an outsider looking in, um, it's hard being a single mom. Hard being a single mom to twin boys, but Julian and Ashley have been through me. Been, I'm sorry, been with me through some really hard times, parenting, and they both helped me with that through the triple P aspect. So I'm gonna go for it. Um, I'm grateful to be asked to work with the teenagers. They are my um, guru. I do like them a lot because um, I'm always the the stern one. Um, so I appreciate to be asked to work with the teenagers again. Um, I helped Julian teach the in-depth class with them, um, and I just kind of hang out because I'm the, usually the bad cop a little bit, but uh, we love it, and so I'm going to go for it, and I think that the plan that, that Julian sent out to us, it will work tremendously because it is going to trickle down into our entire community, and eventually I see other counties or communities looking and modeling after this. So yeah, I mean, I, I guess, I mean, I am in love with Triple P. I guess I'm the one that brought it to Carter County because I took the training in Western North Carolina. Um, and I also have dreamed of scaling it up. So set aside my bias and my love of this program and knowing that the investment, I believe the timing is good, the investment is good. Um, I do think when you scale it up, in order for an evidence-based practice or program to work, you can't just teach to small groups. You have to disseminate it and scale it up broadly. And I hope that if we do this, that we can include it in our evaluation, dissemination and implementation of an evidence-based program. So Dr. Mathis can help us with that too. So um, I love it. I think that it's good. I have some hesitation with being the only person that would say yes or no to a change of a budget of, you know, I think we had $32,000 for a training center in year one, and all of a sudden we're gonna throw all of that, uh, most of that, into one single program. Um, and so I think that it's not just a wash, like, oh yeah, let's do it. I think it's a thoughtful pros and cons discussion. Um, and, you know, it, it doesn't require a budget revision. I think I heard a couple new things today. The reason that we're doing it with the savings is the travel. Now, I would imagine that any program is going to do a lot more virtual trainings after COVID now that they've learned that it works and there'll be less travel for any program. But I think saving that travel makes sense. Um, I just, you know... 
I have some some misgivings, but when I looked back at our budget, we do have significant funds in year two, three, four, and five to continue to build a learning management platform. Um, you know, we can pick this up in year two and, and do it and do it well. And I do see the learning management platform is much broader than just East Tennessee. I think it could be a regional. I think that Appalachia in general could use something for training school members on primary prevention because this is never happening for teachers. And so there's lots of ways that are an online platform based on the model that we based it on, which was a university model for community health workers and public health workers. And so I think if we use that model, it can go well. But yeah, I just wasn't comfortable saying, yeah, sure, let's take all of the money that we're gonna use for a, plan a training platform and put it into one program without input from all of you um, and a thoughtful, you know, pros and cons list, like what is the reason not to? And a couple reasons is that we'll have to put off the, the launching the learning management process until year two. We can't start that really. We can assess it, but we can't pay for a platform. Um, the, the drawbacks would be what if we go all in and people don't teach it or they don't teach it to fidelity or our bang for our buck isn't there or we become known as that triple P place instead of maybe workplace prevention and a lot of the other things that we could do. There are a lot of other things that we can do out there. So there are some cons, but I am not unsupportive of going this route. I just was like, yeah, we need to get everybody in on this and really talk this through really well. I like what you're saying, Angela, about um about that that idea of okay what are we going to do in years two three four and five but if we sow a big seed now right and step out a little bit in faith knowing that all the people who are going to do this training are already fairly seasoned trainers so it's a fairly safe bet that way right like we're not rolling the dice with some unknown quantities that that we think might bug out for lack of a better way to put it is that fair jillian yeah and I have a contract drawn up for everyone. Um, Sam and I, when we did youth mental health first aid, Northeast Regional Health Office sort of paid for that training for us. And so we had to sign a contract that said, we're gonna offer three classes a year. Um, okay. And they check up on us on that. And we actually lose the certification if we don't offer those three classes. Um, and so it'll be a similar model. Um, the first time was a very quick, who can we get into this training? We need to spend this money and um, kind of thing that I would approach completely differently now. Um, different people, different, uh, just a lot, a lot of things differently. And so I think that was a learning experience for me and for all of us to kind of say we can't train somebody without some, um, you know, without a contract or without some some follow up there. Um, so that's something that I'm definitely on top of and making sure that um, the people we select are not selected um, at random either. I mean, it's something that I wouldn't want somebody that is not boots on the ground in this community to come in and say, these are the people that need to do this um, because I can tell you the people that are going to implement it and the people that are not. Um, and so I think just making sure of that, that, that the people we've chosen are willing to sign that contract and that they're people we feel like are, are going to actually do it. Um, can I, okay, so I'm making this pros and cons list as we talk kind of, and I only got one of your cons. Tell me what the other ones were. You said become the triple P place. Yeah, being branded as the parenting place when, when we really want to also, I, part of our vision, and I started to say my vision because it could have been mine, um, but I was thinking part of our shared vision was that a prevention training center would be, um, not just targeted at parenting and parents of children, but like workplaces, workplace prevention and all of those. So if we become the, you're gonna take care of kiddos, maternal child health, parenting thing, are we changing our brand in a way that makes our training center less appealing to other segments of the population? And I'll, I'll tell everybody kind of what my answer to you was in that, that kind of too, that, um, even right now, I talk Triple P everywhere I go, just about um, lots of places regionally have had us come and talk about Triple P, um, but I wouldn't say that anybody would say that's, um, that's what we're known for. Because if you, even right now, if you look at our website, um, I mean, I think we have like 12 or 12 to 15 programs 
just at this moment without any money spent on a training center um, that we offer that are so varied from sexuality education to ACEs to all these different things. Um, and so that's kind of my thought process there is that I think we already offer enough um, without even expanding the training center to not just be triple P focused. Yeah. And my concern isn't now it's when we invest this level of money and do this level of effort in that program, will that change? Will that balance shift any into that? I would just offer that as, you know, I, I don't disagree with your justification. I just think it may shift if we do a lot more triple P. And I think that's why I'm not, necessarily I mean our people will be trained but I think that's why it's so important to have buy-in at Riverside and buy-in at medical care and buy-in at juvenile court and all these other places because then it's when somebody gets a triple p tip sheet at Riverside they're not going to be thinking oh Carter County Drug Prevention did this they're right. going to be thinking my pediatrician provided this for me right. um, same thing with juvenile court nobody's going to say oh this was because of Carter County Drug Prevention they're going to say that probation officer gave me these things um so that's my sort of counter to that, I think, is just that I feel, I do feel like, in a in a way, we will be central, you know, we'll be triple P central if people need to, to interact or whatever. Um, but I think general public wise, I feel like it's going to be more, oh, my pediatrician believes in this, or oh, the school said I should come to this class than it even is associated with us, if that kind of makes sense. I hear what you're saying. And I also think too, I think back I've been working in MAT now nearly nearly 10 years, and most of the patients I've encountered slash clients over the years, they've, they've lamented a lack of parenting skills. Some of them have legit needed a class, mm -hmm. couldn't find one anywhere, literally couldn't find one anywhere. So I think if we do tip it and focus on this for a little bit, I, I think it's probably correcting an overall imbalance in terms of parenting programs in the region. Um, I don't know about all the, all of the parenting programs, but I, I know that when I look for them for, for my folks, I don't find them very easily. So if it takes a little bit of a heavier hand now to balance something that's really lacking, I think that'd be a temporary shift. I hear what Angela is saying about a shift but I think it, it might be required, you know, it might be required to the, the, the grant and the timeline for that. Say that again. How does this affect the timeline for the, on the grant? Well, our timeline is all wonky anyway, um, because our timeline was created thinking that we would be funded in October and we weren't funded until December. Um, and so that's something that actually Stephanie and I have been working on this week is kind of revising that timeline. Um, if is that I, something we have to go back and, and get approval on or? No, we don't. Um, we have to input, um, we actually input that action plan ourselves, And so it's pretty modifiable anytime we want to work on it. I was gonna pull this up. This is not anything fancy at all. It's really just, I created this to kind of wrap my brain around um, what this timeline would look like because that's it's also been a concern of mine is not, not just in this, but also in everything we do. Um, you know, we had a, a lot of things that we said we would do like in December and we didn't even get funded until December and we didn't get staff right. until February. And so going back and, and revisiting those things. Um, so I wanted, I'll show you kind of what I'm thinking for timeline. Um, if I can find it and pull it up. Can y'all see my email right now or no? No. No. Okay. no. All right. Hold on. I'm going to figure this out. While you're looking for that email, um, I just want to reincorporate kind of what Kim Crowder said as well about um, parenting classes for anybody that works with other MAT clients or just, you know, recovery programs. Um, I get a lot of requests for people that are part of DCS or DHS that if you do a parenting program, will it count as my certification? I do know for a fact that Triple P does count for that. Um, and that in itself right there would help out tremendously because we, you know, Red Legacy does get clients that needs triple B parenting. 
Um, I don't get them very often because I don't have many DCS cases, but this is a, that, that's another aspect that we could go towards because it has to be like evidence-based and with a certification or it, it cannot, like it can't work for that. Um, and Judge Bowers won't look at it as, you know, that it's okay when they go into court. So um, I did want to throw that one out there because there aren't many out there that are like that. Um, I think one other, there's one other um, facility that may, <clears throat> I'm sorry, that may teach a family um, or a parenting class that works, but there's none other in this actual county that I believe, that I think of. Yeah, so Families Free offers nurturing parenting. Jill, you can pop in with more info here too if you want to. Um, but that's been a little bit of a, a challenge just because you have to be an active Families Free client. Um, to right. yes. and so um, I think Families Free really has, and we have, Families Free has been great to partner with us um, and let us, we've done seminars where they did part nurturing parenting, we did Triple P. Um, so they're a very engaged partner in this as well. I don't say that to say like it's separate, um, but I do, that's really the only. Um, the only other parenting support that we have in Carter County is through Families Free, and you have to be a Families Free client to access it. So. UT Extension um, does the one like with the courthouse that provides the video when parents are getting divorced in Tennessee and you have to take the class, um, and I'm certified to do that one and would not recommend it. <laughs> Just saying. And, and folks, uh, just in respect of time, we have all been on here for almost three hours, um, I think. And so I love you all dearly and I care about this very much. But if we can, I don't know what we need to do. I, um, it seems like folks are pretty comfortable. I, I hear Chris has a timeline question and he's going to be answered that. But if there's any, I mean, just <laughs> like I'm getting fatigue of sitting and, and I know, uh, but we're, we're like at almost six o'clock. You're good. So can you all see this timeline? Can you see my screen? I can't. Do you see it's a timeline? So nope. Okay. Yes. Yes. I can see it. yes. See it? It has yellow boxes and white boxes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So this again is not anything formal or anything that we'll probably even share with anybody. This was just kind of getting my brain around where we are and where we've come from um, and where we're headed a little bit. Um, so this is when we got the grant um, was December. We actually were able to go ahead and start um, mentor training actually right about the same time that we got the grant. So this was a huge part of our action plan that we've already completed, um, starting mentor training, creating um, the mentor policies and procedures. Um, we actually have already been able to, I barely, barely squeaked in ACEs for coaches. So a big part of DFC that I um, have been really wanting to do for a long time is um, training coaches and building strong brains. And so we were able to, to literally barely squeak that in before they canceled the season. Um, and so we actually created that relationship. We're able to do that first set of trainings with all baseball, um, all really every baseball coach in the league um, before they kind of shut down the season. So we've done that. Um, needs assessment is a huge chunk of this year to me. Um, we've already started newsletter. We have, um, Hopefully in the fall is when we'll do more pictures and sort of that marketing campaign, um, but really spending a big chunk of the next few months doing this needs assessment. Um, this is not something that I completely just pulled out of nowhere. Um, it's based on what Dolly thinks she needs, what Stephanie thinks she'll need to compile it, um, and kind of where we're at right now. Um, so. I feel like through July will be needs assessment. Um, honestly, I think we could have had this done earlier if Dolly were in person in our community and being able to go engage with people, but um, we're rolling it virtually and making it work. Um, and so I feel like July will be a good, um, a good time for us to have that report really nailed down and completed. Um, and I don't, 
I can tell you what I think about a training center based on what I know and who I know and whatever. Um, but I don't feel good making broad statements about, yes, we need a training center. No, we don't need a training center until I see that data um, and see what community organizations are saying and how they feel and if they would buy in and all of that, because that to me is what says, yes, we do this or no, we don't is that hard data from the people that would be the ones buying into it. Um, so I feel like July, we compile it, we have that data. Um, and then that's the point where we say, okay, what does the training center look like from here? So then we have August, um, August, September, and October um, to kind of figure that out. Um, go ahead and get it built or get it, well, probably not get it built because we're gonna need money for that. Um, or get it, get a plan made for that. And then that'll start our new, our year two grant cycle. Um, and so, we'll have that plan ready so that as soon as year two comes, funding comes, we'll know exactly where it's gonna go, if that kind of makes sense. So again, this is not set in stone, reported anywhere. This is just kind of where my brain is um, in looking closely at our action plan, the things we said we would do and the things that we still need to do. Um, I'll also say, this is pretty much everything that we said we would do for the next five years. Um, so we have a chunk of this completed already. And I, I was talking to, to Stephanie or to Dr. Mathis about this a little bit this week too. Um, and looking at how we expand these things even more because we, um, we just have been able to do a lot of things already, um, and get a lot of things in place that I thought would take longer. The coaches thing, I thought I would be in year four before I ever talked them into letting me train them. And, and they did, I mean, it was very, they were very open to it and fantastic. And, um, it tied in perfectly with the mentor program. It just, it worked out. Um, so that being said, I mean, this is pretty much our action plan for the next five years. A lot of these things are ongoing. So continuing to distribute lockboxes and Narcan and do the mentor training. And um, it doesn't mean they're completed. It just means they're in a place where it's going to be easy <laughs> for them to be ongoing for the next five years. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful, Chris, with this kind of timeline. That's just sort of where my brain is. Um, with it at this moment and we're we're actually right now this week working um, with Stephanie to kind of shift that timeline to what actually can happen instead of how we wrote it in the beginning if that makes sense and I do know that DFC is flexible um, they're flexible with your budget revisions they're flexible with your action plans I can't remember if you can roll over funds from one year to the next I can never remember that you can you can yeah and they're yeah. actually <laughs> like they're flexible and then i they're actually being extra flexible because of corona stuff um yeah. and so i think we do have great flexibility with them um to kind of and i think they they understand people can sit in a room and say this is what my community needs and then you go out into the community and they're like that's not what we need and so i think that's where that flexibility comes from um, and they're very very understanding of that so so what's on the table is are folks comfortable taking the majority of year one budget that was used for the learning management platform and putting it into a triple p investment because the timing is right to do that and so we need to get a yes or a no today because or a fist to five you know your version of it um because there needs to be training applications sent out um we need to go ahead and register and 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 make this decision and i don't know if there's any in between but i think it just makes sense to um m you know make a vote now if anyone has I'm, any last minute questions i am before we comfortable making a motion to accept jillian's request for the twenty three thousand dollars Okay, and we don't really have the motions, but I just want to make sure oh, that before my bad. that's okay. No, with it, we don't do Robert's Rules of Order. We might have to do it, but I just want to make sure does anyone else have a question? I don't want to cut anyone off just because I kind of want to be done with this three hour meeting. Um, I really want to be thoughtful. Does anyone else have a question? Jill, you good? No questions? Okay, Kim, we've asked questions. Chris, you asked a question. Did you have any more? No, I think she answered. Okay, and Ashley's been vetted. Ashley and Jillian and I have been emailing for quite some time. 
um, about this. So thank you all for weighing in and, and not putting me on the hook for making this decision. <laughs> and the two of us, I think it makes sense for the full steering committee to be invested um, in these decisions that, that are pretty significant. Okay. All right. You. So let's really fast hold awesome. up your or hold up the hands. Okay. Hold up hands so I can write them down. <laughs> Everyone's waving at me. It's really fun. I got spirit fingers. Oh man, I just got a 10 from Kim Crowder. That's well, it. I'm love, not playing. I sent mine in the chat. Joss, I love you, but you don't get to vote anymore. You're kicked out. Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah, Take vote early, time. vote often. That's right. And did okay. Sam give? Can you see Sam's vote? So she I'll put it in the chat. chat. We got it. Okay. Oh, wait. I, I didn't see it. Okay. I didn't hit in it. Wait, you all can't hear me. Leah, you can't hear me. I didn't put it in the. I didn't hit enter. Sorry. Got there it. we go. Got it. Get it right. Okay, friends. Jeez, Sam. <laughs> Let's do it. All right. Thank you all for entertaining that. Thank so, you guys. You're Jane, amazing. Thank you. I swear we don't normally meet for three hours. Promise. I think you're. I think okay. you're lying. <laughs> just once a once a semester, once a quarter, just once a quarter. And normally yeah. it's like it might be three hours. I don't know. It might be. Yeah. It's fine. I just start to get like losing my mind. My dinner is smelling <laughs> outside. My even even my evening red wine is waiting for me. And I keep getting texts from my partners like, when the heck are you gonna be done? <laughs> never, never, never. I ever. love it. Oh. All, right. All right. Thank you. Guys. Are we done? Do we have other agenda items the next meeting? I don't think so. Now I forgot. Oh, yeah. Um, so next meeting, mark your calendars for that. I don't know what y'all can even see of my screen right now. Um, July 22nd, 12 to 6 is yeah. our retreat. July 22nd, yes. 12 yeah, to 6. I wrote it down. Yeah. And if you have any movement on fundraising or uh, 501c3 we may need to meet before then so there's some things happening um behind the scenes with the 501c3 process that we may need your input on so just if we could leave it open that we might have to meet yep. before then i'm going to call you and say we just received a check for ten thousand dollars yes that'd be awesome Putting that out there just saying yes that will be our next meeting is accepting <laughs> there. But yeah. that, uh, that would be so awesome. That was like a huge, wonderful surprise. That would be nice. I will say though, not to be Debbie Downer, but this is the second time someone said that to me. Oh. Well, the first one I've oh. seen nothing from. So okay. yeah. Jillian, what but, did you but, uh, uh, keep the first one alive. was the first one was sweet Chloe. She's so precious and she's a two and she's amazing. And Matt is maybe different so we'll see yeah well thanks for keeping us keeping our expectations in check <laughs> yeah thanks for crushing right. our soul right. yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. we can do right. it we can do it thank you friends bye, bye. thanks lord jesus <laughs> Girl, girl. <laughs>